Our next session is with um, Dr. Robert N. Diotalevi, and we're going to be talking about copyright. This work provides an overview of copyright law and addresses the new law as well as related issues. Hope it's helpful and you enjoy it. Let's have some fun too. Oh, what a tangle web we weave, Sir Walter Scott once said. But you know, it's true. Copyright law has been a hot topic of late, and you've got to be careful not to get ensnarled in the web. More evident than ever before with the emergence of the Internet as a teaching tool. You know, the Internet was once a research project by the Army, and even though Al Gore takes credit for it, it's the greatest computer system in the world. The net, cyberspace, and copyright law. There are many misconceptions about all of them. For example, many believe that one needs to provide some type of notice in order to possess a copyrighted work. Some think that registration is necessary, or that photocopying requires express permission from the author in all cases. Also, mistakes abound as to the defense of copyrights, as well as thoughts of the dreaded copyright police coming to arrest someone for alleged infringement violations. You know, folks, copyright law is simply misunderstood. How to be happy and safe in cyberland? Oh, sure. Woohoo. I could use anything. It reminds me of that guy in one of the James Bond movies with Pierce Brosnan. He was a computer geek, and he kept saying, I am invincible. Well, you're not. Uh, actually, there's no physicality to copyright. It's a protection, a type of intellectual property that uh, is an attachment of intangible rights, and it occurs when certain rules are followed. It's reminiscent of our federal or state constitutional protections. For example, even though a constitution could burn in a fire, we wouldn't lose our fundamental freedoms contained therein. What is copyright law? Well, there are numerous authors who have addressed the subject. The reason that copyright has been around for most of our country's existence is, well, because it has. In fact, the fundamental basis of copyright law stems from the United States Constitution. In Article 1, Section 8, Clause 8, we find that the Founding Fathers wished to promote science and the useful arts by securing an exclusive right to writings. Section 106, though, of the Copyright Act of 1976 provides the basic framework for all our present statutes. It includes five exclusive rights, and they are as follows. Reproduction of the copyrighted work, preparation of derivative works, that's adaptations, based upon the copyrighted material, distribution of the work, performance of the work publicly, and the displaying of the work publicly. Copyright, though, remember, is a device. One must carefully examine several factors in order to determine whether or not something applies to copyright or that copyright law is applicable to it. And let's take a look at them. Go to the next slide. America's first copyright was signed by George Washington, the man on the $1 bill. Take a visit to this great website. Way back in 1790, he did that, and it appeared in the Columbian Centennial. Uh, Sentinel, excuse me. Uh, let's go over some of the uh, things that we cover in copyright law, some of the things that may be applicable to you. One thing is originality. That's a major requirement. The work must be independently conceived by its creator. There's a famous U.S. Supreme Court a case called Feist, and the court explained in this rather feisty decision, the primary objective of copyright law is, quote, not to reward the labor of authors, to, but to promote the progress of science and useful arts. The case involved the determination of lack of originality in print, uh, white phone directory pages to be uh, exact. Some things are copyrightable, but some things are just out there and not copyrightable. Another key factor is expression. All authors, including those online, must be aware that copyright law affords protection to expressions rather than ideas. Several works do not enjoy afforded protection in copyright, like titles, names, 
slogans, symbols, designs, uh, lettering, coloring, improvisational speeches, unrecorded performances, concepts, devices, systems, methods, calendars. Those things just simply aren't copyrightable. They may enjoy other protections like trademark and patent and the like. Many times there are other legal things that, that cover them. Example of copyrightable material include original, tangible forms of poetry, uh, literature, motion pictures, sound recordings, computer programming, music, plays, videos, photographs, drawings, and the like. One other thing that's required in copyright is something called fixation. It is so fixed when it is sufficiently permanent or stable to permit it to be perceived, reproduced, or otherwise communicated for a period of more than a transitory duration. A work maybe could be sound, images, or both, just like we're doing right now, but it has to be fixed. Just about any form of original expression qualifies as a tangible medium, and this includes even RAM, computer random access memory, as well as notes hurriedly penned on the back of a table napkin. Please go to the next slide. So here again are our basic copyrights, right from the United States Code annotated, Title 17, Section 106. Remember, you have rights, and they are yours, but again, if it is a tangible, fixed medium that you're working with, and it's a, something of originality, then those rights are going to apply. Ownership rights attach whenever one's expression is fixed in that tangible medium. It's often surprising to educators that no major protocol exists to obtain copyright protection. It's not necessary to put that little C uh, uh, in that little circular uh, device doohickey that <laughs> we used to see. Uh, it's okay if you don't have it. Now, it helps, especially if uh, to put people on notice, but that was abolished years ago. Regarding the length of time that copyright protection lasts, uh, it, it used to run for an artist's lifetime plus 50 years. But in 1998, President Clinton signed the Sonny Bono Copyright Term Extension Act, named after, yes, Sonny from Sonny and Cher, a measure extending the term an additional 20 years. And again, don't forget that usual C in the circular symbol or actual word copyright with the date and name of the owner. Let's look at defenses. There are defenses that one can bring up when one uses something that has been copyrighted. The works in the public domain. For example, tax returns. Oh my goodness, you actually photocopied a tax return and you actually used it and sent it to the IRS. The IRS copyright police, now you have two policemen coming after you. Uh-uh. Lenny's not going to come take you to jail, and uh, there's no way that uh, Jack McCoy is going to have to be prosecuting you. The copyright may be expired, or the holder may have forfeited his or her rights in the work. Remember Winnie the Pooh? Copyright expired. Now everybody uses Winnie the Pooh, so go ahead and use it if you want. Winnie the Pooh 101? Maybe a good course. The copyright holder may have granted permission. You can use my work. Well, then how can you complain? If you said, I could use it, and now I'm using it. No different than in a boxing match. Yes, I battered you to death. I did because you said, and the rep said, and the boxing commission said that I could beat up on you. Something called fair use. We're going to be taking a look at that in just a moment. Especially important to educators and the TEACH Act. Go to the next slide. Fair use. There are several defenses available for those who have allegedly violated copyright. And fair use is an exception to normal copyright legalities. It allows in a limited manner use of copyrighted protected materials in items for purposes of parody, news reports, comedic acts, research, education, hello. And there are basically four factors in determining whether or not it is applicable as a defense. Here they are from Title 17 of the U.S. Code, Section 107. We will be citing that statute a lot. 1. The purpose and character of the use, including whether use is of a commercial nature or for nonprofit educational purposes. By the way, do you like my graphic, fair use? It's not illegal to be corny. 2. The nature of the copyrighted work. What is it, in essence? 3. The amount 
and substantiality of the portion used. How much did he use in relation to the work as a whole? And four, the effected use upon the potential market for value. Now this is big. The market for it or the value of it, really big. If there's not much market for it, then the court is less likely to find a violation. But if I take the latest Harry Potter edition and reproduce the whole thing and put Bob Diotalevi on it, oh, we're going to have trouble, especially with number four. Fair use is uh, a case-by-case -case basis, by the way, so we let the courts determine it. Uh, the case of Campbell versus Acuff Rose Music demonstrates this. The court corrected two common lower court errors, and one was to treat the market effect factor as being the most important factor. The other was to give copyrighted work class treatment by holding, for example, that since the copying of the material from one book is an infringement, copying from all books is infringements. The court stressed that simple piracy is to be distinguished between uh, raising reasonable contentions of fair use. And the court reversed the sixth court regarding a group parodying Roy Orbison's Oh Pretty Woman in a song that uh, Mr. Campbell entitled Pretty Woman. After nearly a quarter of a million copies of the recording had been sold, Acuff Rose sued Two Life Crew and its recording company, Luke Skywalker Records. The court applied this four-factor test, and that's what they do. The problem with fair use is, though, that few courts have addressed it. There have been some cases, you can Google them, Basic Books Incorporated versus Kinko's and American Geophysical Union versus Texaco. Uh, these two cases came from the same federal district court with differing results regarding photocopy for education and personal uses. Please go to the next slide. Now we're going to talk about uh, something called the TEACH Act. Uh, before we do, though, I'd like to talk a little bit about something called the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. And you can find uh, the DMCA in a variety of places. And by the way, before I go on, I'd like to mention something uh, first. So I'm going to interrupt my interruption. There are a lot of great, marvelous uh, copyright sites out there, and there are many of them excellent, giving guidelines on fair use and, and going over the Teach Act, the DMCA, and they're based from schools. Google them. Stanford has a wonderful site. Uh, Yale, Princeton, most of the Ivy League schools, uh, Cornell, visit them. They're really fabulous, and they have a, a lot of information, as I mentioned, I think that uh, you'll find most helpful. Now let's talk a little bit about the DMCA. The Digital Millennium Copyright Act was signed by President Clinton on October 28, 1998. It was a bill providing new game rules for the treatment and respect of online copyrighted material. And again, you can go online and you can Google them. Mr. Clinton said, quote, I am pleased that the Congress has passed the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. This bill will implement two new landmark World Intellectual Property Organization, WIPO, treaties. These treaties provide clear international standards for intellectual property protection in the digital environment and protect U.S. copyrighted works, musical performances, and sound recordings from international piracy, close quote. The 150-page document was divided by five tables, and basically, let me just give you a run-through as my busy friend here types. First of all, Title I was the implementation of those two treaties. Title II was a limitation on online infringement for ISPs. Of course, that's Internet Service Providers. It reduced legal uncertainties regarding such items as digital networks. It strengthened anti-online piracy policies. It outlined copyright owners' notification procedures. And it gave a safe harbor for four situations, conduits and system caching and uh, a, a couple of others, which I'll skip here. But let, let me just go over basically. The DMCA limits copyright infringement liability for ISPs. That, that's really big, especially when they don't have any knowledge or they don't have any financial gain. We're an ISP, and we have billions of people on our sites. Uh, what do we know what's going on? Why have us liable for something that a knucklehead did? And there are a lot out there. It makes a criminal a circumvention of anti-piracy devices. Those are called the little black boxes. It updates the library exemption for facilities like we have at our educational institutions to take full advantage of digital technology while engaging in activities similar to those for non-digital methodologies. It directs the Register of Copyrights to consult with educators, copyright owners, and libraries and to submit recommendations. Yes, in distance education, you do have a voice. You have a say. 
It outlaws code cracking devices. Uh, it uh, establishes guidelines and limits liabilities for institutions when faculty members use educational facilities in order to publish materials uh, online. So really, folks, go on and uh, Google the DMCA. You'll find a lot of great articles, some written by yours truly. I mean, those are the real terrific ones. Let's go on to the next slide. The TEACH Act. On November 2nd, 2002, this time President Bush signed into law the 21st Century Department of Justice Appropriations Authorization Act. That was H.R. 2215, which included something called the Technology, Education, and Copyright Harmonization TEACH Act of 2001, with technical amendments to the Copyright Act. On March 13th of 2001, the United States Senate Judiciary Committee met to discuss the measure. And before you knew it, it got signed into law, President Bush again signing that. And the TEACH Act in depth goes into several things which we want to cover uh, in uh, this session. Number one, when digitizing analog works, the new law mandates that no digital version is available, if that is the case. And they must be free from uh, technology protections, no digital versions available. They're free from technological protections that will prevent their uses as authorized. So there's nothing wrong with using it this way. There's no digital version of it. We're not going to violate anybody's rights, and, and nobody's going to be uh, hurt by this. Then educator, educators rock on. You know, you, you can use stuff. Materials can be uploaded onto a server to be disseminated only, this is important, to students, number one. Enrolled, number two in a secure course, number three, in accordance with Section 110, which gives us our, our basic uh, uh, rights and duties here. So remember, this has to be reasonable. It has to be limited. We can't just put things up on the Internet, run hog wild, and invite Sister Susie and uh, Cousin Joe over and to look at it. This stuff that we're using is for teaching purposes, very much like fair use, and it has to be used in accordance with Section 110, disseminated only to students who are actually enrolled. Now, what the students do with it, well, that we can't uh, police. So if a student happens to download something, copy something, send it to somebody in an email, well, we're doing our best. How do we do our best? Make sure that we have copyright policies in effect. We'll talk about more uh, on those later. Number three, materials cannot be for the public. Well, that relates to up top, especially while the regular course is not in session. The stupidest thing we could do is have our person who's uh, dealing with our, our web materials or our webmaster leave the course up. Uh-oh. As educators, make sure that we have that stuff taken down. Make sure that we are policing our police people. Make sure that we have an understanding that that stuff comes down and these things that we're utilizing in our teaching activities are taken care of properly. They should be made available again for what? Class time, when the class is in section, a uh, session, only to students enrolled, and the class should be as secure as possible. Retention of the materials, number four, by the institution is permitted to the extent it's necessary for asynchronous instruction. So we're going to retain these things to sell them. No. We're going to retain these things to, uh, well, we're never going to use them again, but, you know, we, we're pack rats. We don't like to throw things away. You are asking for a lawsuit. You're asking for trouble. The Teach Act is great. It does bring into harmony uh, the analog and the digital, but be careful and do it right. Let's go on to the next slide. Number five. The Act amends Section 112 regarding ephemeral recordings. Those are copies that can be kept solely for transmission purposes. So again, what we want to do is we don't want to sell somebody else's recordings. We don't want to use anybody else's books uh, uh, in any inappropriate way. We want to use this stuff to transmit it to our students, to teach with it, and we don't want it to violate copyright law. Number six, those involved must be educated. You mean the educators in an educational institution have to educate about being educated? Yeah. And as a result, we have to make sure that everybody involved knows about these policies. Hey, a great idea would be somebody like me, invite me down, pay me an exorbitant amount of money. No. But get somebody in. Get a lawyer or get someone maybe who is familiar with copyright from your library to give the faculty, hey, 
be a great uh, faculty and service day. Give the faculty some education about the TEACH Act and about other things. Okay, so that that way, when they are uh, in question about copyright law, they're not just going to go blankly up there. And above all, the people again that need to know this are your web people, the folks that handle all of the putting up of your angel course and the like. Make sure they know about copyright law. Go on the web, and hey, you know something? You can, for educational teach fair use purposes, you may take one of my articles, and I have many, many just, just Google them. You know, I've been paid millions to write these things. That's why I honestly should retire, but I don't know why I keep doing this. Yeah, I, I guess I just love it. But if you want to take one of my articles and you know print it up and make uh, photocopies for fair use purposes, not for money, because I don't get a cut of that, uh, then feel free to do so. You can disseminate it to your faculty. You can pass it out, uh, for example, to uh, your web people, and they can be uh, aware of these things. Also, you will look like a genius, and you will get a raise and make more money. The copyright expert now you are. Number seven, supervision, crucial, and policing by the school. Well, you said, Bob, there are no copyright police. Yeah, I know, but there are school police, and that should be you. You can now become the resident expert. Well, I don't want to be the resident expert. Well, fine, pass this information along to your superiors, and they will be very happy uh, that you did so. You have to supervise. You have to police your students, your courses, your faculty, your dean, yourself. It's crucial because we have to protect the rights of the copyright holder regarding performance or display at your school. Very important. Put signs up. You can buy these signs regarding copyright. This this reminds me, folks, a lot of ADA issues, Americans with Disabilities Act. We have to instruct people on how to act, especially regarding our folks with disabilities, and we have to post warnings. This reminds me a lot of sexual harassment. It reminds me a lot of equal opportunity. You see those signs up there. Well, your institution should have them. You should have statements, and there are plenty out there on the Internet. You could write your own. Students, we don't violate copyright law. What I do in my courses is I post sites, websites to plagiarism, and I post websites to copyright, and I have quoted material with sources that they can look up so that when they violate copyright, and they will, when they plagiarize it, they will, well, I didn't mean to do it, meaning has nothing to do with it. You will violate. You can get the institution into trouble. Yourself in trouble and the student can get into trouble. So be careful, okay? Number eight, the institution must provide notice that materials are or may be copyrighted as well as informational materials concerning copyright. Well, that I kind of hinted that just now. Make sure you tell your students this stuff is copyrighted. Do you want to take the little C and put it in a circle? Copyright Robert D. Otto Levy 2002? Great, that gives notice. You don't have to do that if you write things. Like, for example... This presentation that I'm giving you is copyrighted. You won't see anywhere a little C with the circle. and the, You won't, because I don't have to do that anymore. The Berne Convention and the like got rid of that, as we mentioned before. Okay, So just be careful. And by the way, this is Public Law 107-273-2002. As I mentioned, for President Bush and the Congress, you can Google it if you want the complete uh, uh, law. If you go on to any of my articles, by the way, you will see all of these citations. And so uh, that will give you some fire. Distinct distance learning. Works now include limited and reasonable portions that are used to require that are used to require permission. So an amount comparable to that typically displayed in a classroom. What that means is that if you could have used it in the classroom, woohoo! As Homer Simpson would say, you now can use it online in a transmission. The elimination of face to face. So the things that weren't protected then are protected now, digitally, analog, all protected whether you teach online or not. Copyrighted materials can be stored on a server for synchronous and asynchronous performances and displays, but be careful, don't start passing it around to Aunt Nelly. Digitized versions of analog works can be made that are not available in digital format. We said that. Faculty, staff, and students are absolved of liability for temporary cash copies made in the digital process. Let's move on. Okay, folks, we're going to talk a little bit of the do's and don'ts of this act. Do not digitize an entire literary dramatic work. That is stealing. And don't do it for a dramatic musical work. 
don't retain digital copies past the class section. And of course, if you're going to retain things, uh, you can make an argument that you're going to use it next semester. It's, it's already up for next semester, but you can't retain it if you know, for 50 years. Do use reasonable and limited portions of audiovisual works. Do use reasonable and limited portions of the statutes. You can look those up as to what those are of dramatic musical works. Do not use an entire non-dramatic literary work. Do use an entire non-dramatic musical work. Confused? Good. Print this out. Keep it on your desk. Do use performances of any works that you would in the classroom or your face-to-face. -face. And go to Ball State University. This will help you out. Let's go to the next slide. The U.S. Copyright Office has uh, information for you. There's the phones for in-person or publication uh, information, and you can contact the person and talk to them. And there's their website as well if you want to jot that down. Uh, there's their fax. I don't know why you would ever fax the copyright police except to say, I'm guilty, take me away. But uh, if you want to call them, ask questions and all, they have a marvelous website with a lot of free stuff. It's in the public domain. Woohoo! You can copyright it. Let's go to the next. Oh, you can copy it. <laughs> Let's go to the next slide. Also, I get copyright updates via email. Just send an email to their listserv at listserv at rs8.loc.gov and put in the body of the message and put in also the subject matter, subscribe U.S. Copyright. Put it in your title, put it in there, and make sure that they know, and you will get a nice little handy-dandy email that says, congratulations, you're one of us now, we are one. And so you'll be getting copyright updates. It's a nice little thing to have. Let's move on. Well, folks, it's been my pleasure to give you this presentation. I hope you did learn a little bit of uh, uh, information on copyright and our laws that apply there too. There's my information. I'm from Florida Gulf Coast University, a great place to work, great place to be. If you ever come down, come and visit me. My email address is right there. It looks like Bob Diotta Levy, but my name is so long you cut the VI off. Okay, so it's B D I O T A L E at F G C U dot E D U. Drop me a line if you like this presentation. Great. Go online. Go on the World Wide Web and find some of my articles, and hopefully that'll help you there. The scales of justice are there to remind you: do not steal it, and make sure, above all things, have a great time teaching. Stay honest and copy it right. Seventh year, Nelly, uh, that we've been doing this together. What I had Nellie put up was from the Copyright Clearance Center, uh, and as she's working on it, it's about the TEACH Act. And we're going to focus heavily on that. But before we do that, and while we're waiting for folks uh, to come back, I urge you to type a message uh, to me if, if uh, you'd like in the Zoom group chat, if you have anything on copyright. I want to cover some of the basics. We're going to look at this TEACH Act, and then we're going to have a quiz. And it doesn't count, but uh, sometimes, Nellie, what she'll do is uh, she'll put up a little voting area where you can vote yes or no. Uh, they're all yes or no questions. Uh, first of all, copyright law is American in nature. And uh, when I say American in nature, what I mean is that it's based on United States law. So if you have uh, any type of question as to whether or not is this legal to do in Venezuela, I have no clue. We have something called the Berne uh, Conference and the Berne Treaty, which I mentioned in my PowerPoint. Some of you maybe saw it on YouTube or if you muddled through here or if you look at it later. The Berne Convention and the Berne Treaty basically solidified uh, a lot of um, laws uh, from around the world uh, and, and in essence uh, said that we would recognize uh, foreign powers laws, they'd recognize ours. However, copyright law, again, uh, is American in nature. It is federal in nature. Most of you who aren't in our country, uh, maybe not familiar with this, and uh, folks even in our country uh, aren't, I I'm always amazed at folks that are Americans that don't know our law or our legal system. But we have a bicameral system, a two-tier system, uh, by which we're a republic, we're not a democracy. And the definition of a republic basically is you have the big federal government and you have the 50 little kingdoms, the, the state governments. Copyright law is federal in nature. In other words, it comes from the federal constitution, not state law. It comes from the Congress uh, of the United States, the House and the Senate, not a uh, state law. Uh, so uh, basically we see that it is American, it is not international, it is federal, it's not state-based, and uh, it, it basically is 
in essence, civil law. There are some criminal penalties when you look at the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, the Teach Act, but 99% is uh, based on civil law. In other words, plaintiff versus defendant, good old fashioned lawsuits. We call the lawsuit copyright infringement. So if I infringe upon your copyright rights, if I steal stuff that doesn't uh, uh, belong to me, then you're going to sue me uh, in copyright. So as we saw, tried to see with my PowerPoint, and I think by now uh, most of the folks are back probably from watching it on YouTube. But again, uh, shoot me an email, uh, and I'll give you my email address later if you have any questions. If you have any questions during this presentation on copyright law, uh, please feel free. Um, Nellie's asking everybody, can you see this Teach Act? Can everybody see that okay? It's from the Copyright Clearance Center. It should be dead center of your screen. Okay, Judy says yes. And what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at the TEACH Act. Thank you, Helen. Good. Okay. Thank you, Nellie. Now, basically, could we scroll this up, uh, Nellie, a little bit so we can kind of see this? George Bush, as I mentioned in my PowerPoint, signed this act, thank you, Nellie, in 2002. And it's technically called the Technology, Education, and Copyright Harmonization Act, or the TEACH Act. And under this, instructors can use a lot of things that they, they couldn't back in the olden days uh, online. I do a lot of teaching online. I've been teaching online now. This is my 21st year teaching online. Uh, Nellie mentioned to you, as my bio indicates, I'm in sunny Florida. And I feel bad for all you folks. It's very cold where you are. I know it's very cold up north uh, and especially uh, up in the Midwest and the like. I know you feel terrible for me, but this is the first time today, a couple of hours ago, in four months that I went in my swimming pool. I finally got my heater going. I, I got off my uh, blessed assurance and <laughs> uh, got, got into the uh, heating mode, and I had to heat for about three days and raise the temperature from about 68 to a nice 85, and so it was very nice. But wherever you are, I'm uh, very happy to have you here, and again, thanks to all of you. Back to the Teach Act. Students can participate regarding the TEACH Act in distance learning, online courses, and as you know, virtually from anywhere as we're doing uh, asynchronously. There's a lot more latitude. Oh, it looks like it's in Chinese here now, Nelly. Okay, uh, my Mandarin's a little bit rough, you know, but we'll try to uh, model through this. This is uh, technology in action today, folks. I usually present with Nelly once a year. Sometimes I do it twice a year. And again, I've been with Nelly now. This is my 11th year. So I probably presented for her 15 times. And this is probably the most technology uh, um, challenged we've been. <laughs> is, is that the good word, Nellie, for it? Uh, but we're getting through it. And I appreciate your patience again. Now, a lot of you teach in a nonprofit uh, educational uh, area. And so as a result, we're gonna kind of cover what the TEACH Act uh, requires and what the TEACH Act covers, especially in light uh, of America. Uh, Maha says, is there a global law that can be accepted in most countries, save time and money? No. Again, uh, Maha, as I mentioned, we have the Burn Act, B-E-R-N-E, in which it took away that requirement from having the little C uh, in, the, in the copyright circle there, B-E-R-N-E, yes, thank you, Nelly. So Google that sometimes. Basically, it's a treaty, and it allows countries to recognize each other's laws. However, there isn't some hard and fast law. When you think of law, Maha, that's an excellent question that you ask. Think of law that usually is not on a global scale. For example, if I were to hit somebody, if I were to commit battery in America, that's going to be a far cry than if I do it in India. If I were to commit treason in the United States, I would probably go to jail. I could be executed. But in many, many countries, it would be automatic lifetime or automatic execution. Some countries you'd get a trial, some you wouldn't. And that's the thing about law. It is not global in nature. There are very, very few laws that are global in nature. So just as America has its own laws regarding uh, criminal uh, realm, regarding the civil realm, hitting somebody, we call that a tort, a T-O-R-T, not to be confused with T-O-R-T-E, which is a wonderful French pastry, which I enjoy. But uh, so that's kind of the, the quick and dirty answer. So copyright, again, is very much American-based. At least that's what I've studied. That's what I've done my articles on. That's what I've done my presentations on. Consult the Berne Act to see if your country is involved in the treaty that do you recognize American laws? Do we recognize yours? Now, obviously, we're not going to recognize Iran, Iraq, 
uh, you know, uh, countries where, let's face it, we don't have great treaties anyway. But England, France, Italy are very possible, okay? So now, in order to have a course of, uh, online, in order to teach online, in order to utilize what we have utilized in the non-digital realm, the TEACH Act allows us uh, a lot of leeway. And so, uh, Nelly, if you could scroll down just a little bit more, uh, I'm looking at under TEACH Act requirements, and that paragraph that says, in order for the use, oh, a little bit up, Nelly, a little bit more up, you went down too far. Uh, we're going to read some of these requirements. And so if we go, oh, it turned it into Mandarin again. That's good. Uh, if we go a little bit up where it says that second paragraph, which I think you're just about on it. Uh, mine's all jumbled, though. So while she works on that, we're going to take a look, and I'm going to give you some uh, hypotheticals. I'm going to cover some cases for you. Uh, I'm also going to do some, again, testing you, so I hope you, you brought your thinking caps. Notice, in order for copyrighted materials in distance education to qualify under TEACH, now what do we mean by that? You're not going to get sued. You're not going to be bothered. The, the copyright police, remember they don't exist. Uh, they're not going to come after you, okay? What's going to happen is you're going to be able to use other people's materials. And you say, well, Bob, we could do that under fair use. I know, but now we're talking about the digital realm, okay? Now we're talking about online. What can you use? What, what can't you use? Notice the institution has to be accredited, nonprofit, educational. So if this is Amazon, the Amazon Corporation, and they're trying to put something up on their website, no, 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 no. For the TEACH Act, signed into law by President Bush again there, uh, it treats digital and non-digital the same. We're going to afford you the same copyright protection as you had if you were in a live classroom. So under fair use, you know that you can make a copy of, let's say, this part of a chapter of a book and pass it out to your, your students. Can you do that online? Let's see. You can show this video in your classroom. Aha, can you put it online? Can you put it on a website, uh, a, a teaching site, one of your educational course sites and do it? So the institution has to be accredited, not for profit, and has to be educational. The use must be part of mediated instructional activities. In other words, this is part of your teaching regimen. You are using this part of a book. You're using this musical piece. You're using this video, a portion thereof or whatever, in order to instruct people. You're not doing it charging money. Uh, oh, uh, by the way, class, you're in my geography class. Well, this Sunday from three to five, I'm showing the full version of Titanic. And if you send me a check, I'll give you the, no, wait a minute, hold it. That's profit making. Remember what fair use is all about. When I went over fair use, those four criteria of fair use, the last one is a biggie. Does it affect the economic impact? In other words, does this use that you are engaging in, does it affect in such a way where you're literally copying Harry Potter books and selling them cheaply, putting your own name on them, stealing them, things like that? That's verboten. That's not allowed. The use must be limited to a specific number of students enrolled in a specific class. So how do you do that? Password protection, user ID. The students are enrolled in the class, they paid for the class, nobody else is seeing this material that you're putting up, whether it be a link to something, whether it be a video. You say, okay, Bob, what happens when the student then shares it? They're violating the copyright, not you, okay? So if you are limiting the use to a specific number of individuals, your students enrolled in a class with user password protection and the like, uh, then you're going to be okay, all right? And what we'll do later on is Nelly uh, kind of fixing this. We'll look at a few cases. I'll give you some scenarios and see how well you do. Now, you say, well, um, you know, Bob, wait a minute. I mean, there, there are cases out there that people actually sue each other. Absolutely. Judy says there are some teachers that think they can tape off the screen of a film snippet and upload it to YouTube. Don't they realize they're violating copyright laws and are not protected by the Teach Act when those snippets are open to the public and the links are being given out to others? Absolutely right, Judy. And you bring up just a, a nail of a thing that we got to put in here in this coffin to nail all this down. People think, and they have this mistaken impression, if it's on the internet, it's, it's fair game. That is the stupidest thing that you can think. 
It would be no different than if you went into a bookstore and said, hey, look at all the books. And somebody said, hey, guess what? We're giving these books away. You are? They're mine. I own the copyright now. No. How do you think the author of Harry Potter or the, the author of a book, let's say that you wrote, I've written books, how would we like that? It, whether it's sold to you or you give the argument, well, I paid my $30 for Dr. Giardo Levy's book and therefore I own it now. It's mine. You own that copy, but you can't copy it, as Judy mentioned. You can't go on uh, websites and start stealing stuff, okay? The best thing in the world is to have some type of disclaimer, some type of copyright warning that says, look, the stuff on this course is for my course only. It is for nobody else except my course. And if you take it, you're, you're um, committing copyright uh, violations and cite you know, off my PowerPoint or my articles or the like, uh, cite some stuff, okay? Nellie, can we fix uh, this? Or I'm not sure if we're gonna be able to. Yeah, to... I'm not sure that. Um, okay, no, no problem. Fix, That's but no I don't problem. see any problem. I mean, That's I, I no don't problem. see Chinese that you see. Okay, well, let me read some of these to you folks and then I'll ask you some of the questions, okay? The materials to continue. Okay, oh, wait a minute, hold it. Judy also says, I actually attended a workshop where a teacher encouraged other teachers to screen, copy films, and then upload it. Oh, my goodness. That, yeah, it's, the one thing about this, uh, as I said, Judy, you're going to become a copyright expert at your place just by uh, utilizing my PowerPoint and all that's copyrighted. Uh, <laughs> but um, if you'd ever like me to uh, address your, your uh, group, your dean, your ac uh, academic uh, uh, folks or whatever, I'd be happy to do so. Just shoot me an email and I'll give you my email at the end. But uh, no, honestly, you're going to be so far ahead just even by being at this um, uh, presentation. Nelly should charge millions for this. I know she pays me millions. But um, honestly, it, when you go to your dean, when you go to your program director, when you go to your faculty and you tell them what you learned from this, it's going to be, wow, we are violating all types of laws. Yeah, stop. Okay. <laughs> Make sure that you tell your students not to do it as well. You should never ever copy more than what you're authorized to transmit. And if you watch my PowerPoint, and again, I'm sorry, we can't get it up right now, but toward the end, the last maybe three or four slides, I give you a list of the percentages. Sometimes you can put up a total thing, but sometimes you can only put up 10% of it. You can put up, you know, as Judy mentioned, a snippet of something. You can't put up, a, you can't copy an entire book. You can't copy an entire chapter. And these are all hard and fast rules that are set uh, by the TEACH Act. So again, as I go over the TEACH Act, as you uh, have this link here that I put up, and um, what I can do here is, I still got it. There's the link again. So if you guys want to save it maybe to your favorites, uh, it, it's the TEACH Act, it's a PDF. Uh, that Nellie was trying to work on, uh, and uh, you know we're having technical difficulties today. So, uh, but but take a look at it sometimes. It's up there. You can click onto it, maybe save it uh, now or save it later, and it'll give you the different types of uh, Teach Act requirements. In fact, if you'd like to do that now, if you want to click on to that link that I just put up, because as we kind of wrap up. Uh, feel free again to look up that link, look up any of my links that I have on my PowerPoint, watch my PowerPoint again. If you guys need anything, let me just give you, I don't want to forget. Bob, don't you want to try the quiz? Yes, we're going to do that in a second, Nellie. Oh, okay, good. Yeah, that's my, that's my email address. It's bdiotail, because they couldn't fit Bob Diotaletti, at fgcu, uh, fgcu, Florida Gulf Coast University edu. I scared Nelly for a second. She saw me putting out my email. I usually do that at the end. But no, Nelly, you might not have heard. I want to do that just in case I forget at the end. Shoot me an email if you need something. If you'd like me to present to your faculty, if you'd like me to talk to your dean, uh, whatever the case may be. Now, everybody go to that copyright.com website and you'll have the Teach Act in front of you with all of those uh, things that we were looking at. And in that little box where we were looking at all the different types of uh, requirements and all, all we're supposed to be doing. What I'm gonna do is I'm going to, and uh, see if Nellie can do this or not, put up a yes, no box and you can vote. If we can't do that, we'll just vote in the chat, uh, uh, Zoom group uh, chat. But I'm gonna read you some scenarios as we end and see how well you do. We're gonna put you in these scenarios and we're gonna make you the teacher and see whether or not you do well on the Teach Act. Now, let me read you the scenarios and we'll do two or three as, as we wrap up. I know we're kind of running out of time. 
But put yourself in these scenarios and see how well you do. You're teaching an advanced placement American history class at a high school. It's available to students in an online, password protected Blackboard environment, okay? So you're the teacher, they hired you to teach this summer American history. It's a high school, it's accredited, and you're teaching in an online password protected Blackboard environment. You wanna set the stage for the environment in Germany prior to World War II. You own a videotape. You bought it with your own money. It's yours. It's called Swing Kids. It's a movie depicting the lives of young adults prior to World War II. You ask the instructional media staff to digitize a 10-minute clip of Swing Kids to be put in the Blackboard course. My question is, as you look at the copyright.com link that I gave you, as you look at those Teach Act requirements, can you do that? Yes or no? Nellie, do we have a, maybe a little um, voting poll place that we can do? Oh, she did. What do you think? Thank you, Nellie. That's question one. Is it yes, you can put up that 10 minute clip of Swing Kids on your blackboard or no? You vote and then we'll tabulate it and see how well you do. Take a look at the Teach Act requirements. Take a look at everything that I've been talking about in your mind, picture it. And I know it's mind blowing. And uh, think about my PowerPoint and what you've learned today from the Teach Act. And don't worry, just take a guess. If you get it wrong, no problem. That's what we're here for. We're here to learn. And Nellie will give our results. Everybody vote. It's password protected, 10 minute clip. You own the video. You're teaching history to students in an online password protected Blackboard environment. Can you do that? And Nellie, whenever you have the tabulation, we only have four people, so don't be afraid. Yeah, please vote. We're not, we're not, yeah, we're not gonna take uh, your name. We're not gonna send the copyright police. How many folks do we have here, Nellie, by the way, do you know? I saw a count, but I've lost it. The results are in, 75% okay. say yes, 25 say no. Well, you 75% percenters, Good for you. The answer is yes. According to the TEACH Act, an instructor can use a reasonable and limited portion of a dramatic performance, for example, a film, assuming there's no digital DVD copy of the film, a portion can be digitized and uploaded into the course. The clip has to be formatted as streaming audio to prevent copyright distribution. And the key to that whole thing was password protected. And that's something hopefully that I've gotten into you. Make sure it's a place that is nonprofit. It's an accredited program, accredited institution, like a high school, a university, or whatever. And it's password protected, so not just every Tom, Dick, and Harry can get it, okay? It, it is password protected, so not public viewing. That's right, Judy. And again, go back to what I mentioned before. But what if some crazy person, uh, one of your students, decides to give it to somebody? That's their problem. They're violating copyright. You put your policy up, you protected yourself, the institution's protected, and you're gonna look like a genius. Okay, we got time for maybe one more. I know we gotta wrap. I know you folks have to move on. Let's do one more and see how you do. Nellie will tabulate it, and then we'll wrap it all up. I'm not gonna tabulate. Can you just add in the chat box, everybody? Thanks. Oh, okay, uh, ta just type in the chat box, yes or no. Okay, here's the next one. And you're an instructor for an online geography course, and you're using Blackboard. You're covering a topic of volcanoes, and you want to digitize a full 30-minute NOVA program entitled Volcanoes Deadly Warning. The program was recorded off a local PBS affiliate the week before on VHS or DVD, and you want to make it a real media streaming film of the program to give your students more information about volcanoes and signals that can warn people when a volcano is going to erupt. No DVD of the NOVA program exists. Now that's amazing because normally they'll say, send us $25.99 and you can get this DVD. So NOVA must have messed up because they're always trying to sell their programs, but there isn't one. Can you do this under the Teach Act? Can you digitize the 30 minute NOVA program? This one's a little tricky. You have to know PBS rules, which I don't know if you know. 
Everybody's saying no. What if I told you PBS allows you to tape off air for classroom use, which they do? You see little messages sometimes that say, feel free. What if I, does that change your mind at all? If I told you PBS has no problems with this, you can do it. They allow people to tape off the air. There are teacher taping rights, and especially there's no DVD uh, of the, the program existing. That should change your mind because could you do this out of the Teach Act? Yes. Since it's a documentary, it's non dramatic. And in that little list, it says non dramatic full videos or DVDs can be placed in streaming format. Don't you hate this? Wonderful. That makes me a commodity. <laughs> so basically, you're totally stymied and confused by this stuff. Good. I wanted to get you to think. I can't make you a lawyer in an hour. It took me three years. And I can't teach you copyright in an hour. Uh, usually, I teach it to my students in 16 weeks. But I want to get you moving. Judy says, yes, but is the program itself copyrighted? It is Judy, but we did a two-fold thing here. PBS allows teachers to use it, and the Teach Act allows you to put it online. This whole thing that we did today, everything is copyrighted, Judy. If you get permission, you're okay. If it's in the public domain, like Winnie the Pooh, I mentioned Winnie the Pooh lost its copyright, it's okay. If it's like an IRS tax form where the tax people go, make all the copies you want, it's okay. If it's fair use in a live classroom and it's okay to use it under fair use, it's okay. And when the owner of a copyrighted work like NOVA and PBS says use it and we can get through the TEACH Act, which we did, it's okay. This entire presentation basically was trying to get us uh, to talk about copyright. Do all web, do all website, are all websites copyrighted? Probably they are. Uh, and and if, if they've been put up and if they're original, they're put in a domain that's tangible, they don't have to have uh, um, the little C inside the circle anymore, I would guess yes. So be careful, especially when you're linking to other sites uh, and the like. Open source, uh, what do you think? Hmm. I'll let you look up that, Nellie. I'm not going to tell you everything now. I think you're right. Well, we're about out about out about about it. We're about out of time, <laughs> and I'm out about out of brain cells. Not really. uh, yeah. Oh, do we have more time? Oh, good. Uh, Maha says, if a research is published in a journal or magazine, is this partly copyright copyrighted? No, Maha, it is totally copyrighted. Most likely, either the author or the publication <laughs> or both own it. And so like when I publish, I've, I've published about, oh my goodness, 80 manuscripts and a few books. Whenever I publish, I always get this uh, document from them. And it usually will say that the author retains the copyright. However, we have copyright also you know, for our publication. So that I can publish my work elsewhere. It's still my work. I don't lose my copyright right. But their publication of my article is theirs in their publication. See what I mean? I know I'm kind of spinning all the way full circle here. That means that just because my article or manuscript is in their publication, I don't own their publication. You don't own their publication. And if you want to republish my article in their publication, you've got to get permission. Now, if it's the TEACH Act we're talking about or fair use, then you probably can make a copy of the article pass it out, as long as it doesn't diminish the financial gain that they're getting, as long as it doesn't diminish or uh, their financial resource from it, or affect the marketplace, or affect their profits, then they should be okay. And especially if it's for teaching. But the hardest thing about the TEACH Act is, again, go back to the TEACH Act itself, that uh, website I just gave you, and also go back to my PowerPoint. There are hard and fast set dirty little rules about music about dramatic versus non-dramatic, uh, comedy versus non-comedy, and those are the things you have to be aware of. It is a real pain. When in doubt, ask permission when you do things. When in doubt, make sure that you follow the TEACH Act, follow those guidelines that, that I gave you. And that's why I gave you the scenarios, not to, to trick you or whatever, but kind of just to get you to think, okay? The problem with law is when you teach it, you open up more cans of worms 
uh, uh, than, than you want to. <laughs> Judy says, people have to be careful. Just because something's on PBS, it's not always okay. PBS doesn't have copyright control. That's true, absolutely right. So at the very end, Judy, you see like, what's the copyright? You know, copyrighted Air England, 1997 by the British government. So holy mackerel, wait a minute, right. They got, and I say they, PBS, got the right to show it, to transmit it. That doesn't mean they necessarily own it, right. You always have to find out who the owner is. So for example, the copyright presentation you saw, I own it. I didn't go out and copyright it somewhere and file papers or whatever, register it, but it's mine. And so unless you get permission, you can't use it. Same thing as Judy mentioned, so with PBS, with anything, just because it's on TV, Think of it like walking into a bookstore. You can't walk into a bookstore, buy a picture, buy a piece of music, buy a book or an article, and all of a sudden you say, well, you own it. You own that copy. And as a result, you don't have the exact right to treat it like your original work, make copies and start selling it uh, and, and the like, okay? Uh, let's see, Judy says, no, because the minute you create something that's copyrighted to you. That's right. It is automatically copyrighted to you. You are the owner. Just as, as I mentioned when I did that uh, copyright uh, presentation, the, the PowerPoint, the minute I made it, it becomes mine. I don't even have to have it published. Let's say I have an article that never gets published. That still is mine. So when in doubt, make sure under fair use, if you're in the classroom, it doesn't heavily affect the marketplace. It doesn't steal from somebody's making money off of it. Okay, don't copy an entire book. Okay, and when it's teach, when you're teaching online, Password protected courses. Make sure you have user password uh, uh, protection. Make sure it's uh, for only the students. Make sure you don't use too much. Consult the Teach Act and the like. We've covered an awful lot of stuff here, and I just appreciate Nellie again. Nellie, I don't know where the 10 years uh, have gone. Uh, you and I looked like it was 10 years ago. Of course, that's why I wear glasses. But uh, Nellie, I appreciate you. I thank all you fine folks. Again, if you need me, I posted up there my email. When you watch uh, at the very end, uh, the PowerPoint, my address, my phone number, my email, you got the link to the PowerPoint, it's all there. Thank you very much, folks. Enjoy the Are conference. Are there any questions that you'd like to ask? I mean, uh, by voice instead of uh, anyone, just grab the mic. Uh, you can unmute yourself and ask. Judy, would love to hear your voice. Maha, Helen. Hey, I want to see if these folks actually exist. Exactly. Uh, yeah, I do. Let, let me, let's see you, Judy. Then we'll know Where's you. Judy? Hang on. Judy is in New York. Undo the whatever. Oh, there it is. <laughs> Hi. So yes, copyright is a very tricky thing. And as an artist and a writer, I know for a fact copyright is very serious, but mostly people don't realize that the only reason for actually registering your copyright in the DC for the United States is if for financial reasons. Because if you register it, you have financial fallback quickly. What do you mean, what do you mean by that, Judy? Um, meaning that if somebody violates my copyright and I have it on file in, in DC, I can't, there is a certain amount of money I am entitled to if I could prove somebody violated that copyright. Whereas if I have the copyright because I, I made it and I have some sort of proof like a time date stamp or a, a postal stamp or something that shows that I did actually create that at the time that I created it, right. I would actually have to incur like legal stuff to try and act right and and the thing too judy is to interrupt you the thing too is it, it's evidence right it doesn't make your copyright right any better or any worse no, it's you've just, got you've got that piece of paper it's evidence it's, i always say it's like having the u.s constitution that could burn right. down you still have your freedom of speech rights right. but it sure helps when you get that original document right. and you put it up and go look at this the founding fathers say i have it right. yeah or i, have, copy this, of it. I right. have this paper and right. you know, it's right. a little bit of a more of a deterrent. That, that's right. Absolutely right. You don't have to, but it I helps. Was, I was really horrified. I went to a conference one day, and there was this young man who was giving a whole thing on a wonderful lesson using clips from films and television. And, you know, somebody asked him, and they said, how do you get those clips? He goes, I just tape it using my phone. Oh, 
from oh. my TV screen. Right. And he goes, and then I upload it to YouTube so that my students can see it. I said, you do realize that's violating major right. copyright right. laws. And he probably will, he probably will never get caught, but if and when he does, he loses his job and the institution gets sued and he gets sued and well, it's, just it's, a myriad of things. It's a major thing. And plus you're messing with the, the theatrical unions on top of it. Right, that's right. And yeah. as a union member, uh, let me tell you, that's not funny. Right. <laughs> Some good points. Thank you. Also, uh, I believe it's Nordine. Thank you so much for your comment, Nordine. Uh, Nordine says uh, that uh, the eyes were opened up. That's what we're here for. Uh, this is a new topic for a lot of folks. I don't know how I got involved in this. Basically, I got involved in copyright law about, oh, 15, 20 years ago. I started doing presentations. I started doing uh, book chapters. I started doing manuscripts and the like. And I just really got enamored with it. And I got enamored with it because so many people, as you know, uh, Maha's mentioned, as Judy's mentioned, as Nordine's mentioned, they just don't realize it's out there. It's amazing. We just don't think about copyright law and just the myriad of problems that you could run into and lawsuits. And, and you know, as, as just mentioned here too, um, as Judy mentioned, you're gonna get into more trouble than you ever think possible and get lawsuits and possibly lose your job. And really, and your reputation is going to be absolutely gone when people are finding out that you're plagiarizing, you're you're violating copyright laws and the like. Well, especially today when we have so much access, international right. access, internet right. access, these right. young people really don't get it because they, I mean, it's on there, so I have it. No, it's not yours, and you can get into big trouble for that. Right, and um, we have we have the big magnificent library called Google. That <laughs> All of a sudden, you just punch in a punch in Judy's and, name, and, Ramaha's name, and then, oh, what's she stealing now? And then all of a sudden, they, they hit print, and you've got right. a nice big file, and you run to your lawyer and say, look what this person's doing with my stuff. It's instant evidence. Really? And so, it's, it's you know. it, people just don't, they really, really don't yeah. get it. I mean, when I do my presentations, people don't understand. They're like, why are you not posting all these photographs and, and videos of your classes? They said, it can't. Right. Right. I just can't, yeah. you know. Good point. Good point. I have to get special permission, right? You know, yeah. and the minute this stuff goes up on on public access, you're dead yeah. meat. Right. That's true. <laughs> and good. Good stuff. people don't realize that you know, if they live in other countries, they think, well, I don't live in the states, so you know, no, right. cares. They sue me, no. and then right. <laughs> right. Yeah. The, well, thank you, know, you again, Nellie. Smaller. Thank you, thank you, Bob. Thank you. At least once a year, twice a year, we get a yep, chance. Yeah, uh, we try. To think <laughs> about these things and, and try to warn our students and teachers. Right. Students. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you tomorrow. All right. Thank you, folks. Take care. Thank you, Nellie. Have a good one. Issues. I have no idea why it happened, but it happened. Well, we got a year to figure them out, Nellie. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, everyone. Thank Bye, you. Thank you. Have a good one.